Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the key metaphysical questions that Rene Descartes is going to provide an answer for, a very resolute answer you might say as well, in his Meditations on First Philosophy, is the issue of the freedom of the will. And Descartes very clearly decides on the side that there is freedom of the will. He also clarifies what that freedom will consist in. It's a little bit different than some other people's views on it. And all of this is going to be found in Meditation 4 in the discussion about the interplay between the will and the intellect or understanding when we fall into error and how that error can be avoided through the proper use of the will. So one of the things to point out right from the beginning is that Descartes' way of addressing error is going to involve using the will to constrain or place limits upon the will. That is a reflexive use of the will. And this is something that, you know, in the long tradition that's leading up to Descartes, was recognized by most theorists that the will is something that can bear upon itself. That's something that you might say rather unique to it. Um, sometimes we think about the rational capacities also doing something like that. Reason or the understanding can understand itself. The will can choose how to structure the will. So what is the will? Um, Descartes doesn't give us a treatise on the will as such, but he, he does tell us that the will, and he's willing to use two different terms here that historically have been associated with it, volonté, in Latin voluntas, right? And libre arbitre in French, uh, libertas arbitri, right? Um, the, the choice of the will and the will itself. He tells us that it is a power of choosing, in French, élire, uh, a capacity to select or to, if you like, want to stay very close to it, elect, that is to, to select something out of a range. So a little bit later, he will tell us that it consists in, um, and he does use that, that term there, consiste, right? And consistat in the Latin. He says that what the will is, is this, um, uh, here we go, it consists only or solely in that we can, pouvons, do something, faire en chose, or not do it. So this is the general conception. We can do something, we can not do something. In the Latin, it's actually even clear, vel facere, vel non facere, right, to, to, to act in some way. Now, it's something that's internal to us, but it's going to be externalized in many cases. So what are the, the, the some things that we can do or not do? I mean, if we think about specifics, it's practically unlimited. And that's another point that Descartes going to make about the will. But we can arrange them under four main headings. Two of them have to do with what we might call the realm of the theoretical, uh, the realm of the true and the false, that is to affirm or to deny. And notice that for Descartes, it's not the intellect or the understanding that affirms or denies anything. 
It is the will that does so by engaging in judgments about what it is that the understanding puts forward uh, for the will to consider. Or we might say the memory or imagination or the senses or any of these, these other faculties as well that we typically think of as cognitive, right? So the cognitive supplies the conative or the uh, voluntary or volitional with its raw material. And then the will operates on it by affirming or denying. He also uses the term to assert, right? Within the realm of the practical, which is something that Descartes is, is very concerned with, um, we can also pursue Persuive, right? Or flee, fuir. Um, and that extends not only to actually pursuing in the sense of physically chasing after something, but to orient ourselves in that direction. We can desire it. We can choose it. We can prioritize it. Flee isn't always running away from something. It, it also means to reject, to be averse to. So we have there the positive and negative valences of all of our practical life. This is all within the domain for Descartes of the will. So this is quite important to keep in mind. He's also going to tell us that the will is the most extensive of the faculties that we possess. As a matter of fact, you could in fact go so far as to say the will is the only truly extensive faculty that we possess. Extensive in the sense of the French étendu stretched out to all sorts of things. Um, so it's the most extensive faculty. How so? It's not contained. It's not, uh, you might say, hemmed in or, or walled off, enfermé, right? It's not uh, closed within any limits, any uh, boundaries. That is, anything that you can put in front of the will, the will can go beyond that. So in theory, although he says it, the experience of the will is quite vague, he uses the term there, um, if we think about what we can in fact choose, it, it goes you know, on and on and on and on. Um, we can, you know, affirm or deny, we can pursue or flee, we can do these in a number of different modalities. And so he says that the will, and he uses these terms here, is perfect, parfait, and extensive, right? Ample uh, is another way of uh, rendering that, ample and perfect, um, extended, all, all of these things are things that he says about the will. A little bit later, he, he actually says something quite interesting. He uh, talks in terms of uh, something almost reminiscent of, of Anselm's you know, conception of that then which nothing greater can be conceived. He says that the will is so great that uh, you cannot conceive of another that would be more ample and extensive than it. The human will has a certain kind of infinity to it, you might say. So he says that um, because of this, that's how I primarily uh, know myself, know that I, that I uh, carry or bear the image and resemblance to God, the likeness of God that's talked about in Genesis. How so? Well, you know, God's will is in some respect more extensive because he has greater power and um, he has greater knowledge. So whatever God wants to happen can happen, right? Um, and <clears throat> God, having you know, perfect knowledge, will will the best things. But our will is, in a certain sense, as extensive as the divine will. And this is very interesting when we think in terms of freedom. Especially within a theistic context, Oftentimes, the notion of a divine will or divine knowledge ends up proving to be a difficulty for humans truly possessing free will. In Descartes' case, that's not at all what happens. So we have, according to Descartes, freedom of the will, and it, that freedom itself is not contained within limits. That's part of the limitlessness of the will. And here we can contrast two different conceptions of freedom that Descartes uh, works with, but he's not going to make a rigid distinction between them, but other later thinkers have. 
There's what we can call the freedom of indifference. Freedom where we, well, this is how we often conceive of, of genuine freedom. We have two or more options in front of us. There's no external force keeping us from selecting one of them or forcing us to select one of them. And um, we can decide between them. Going a little bit further, if we don't have any inclination or reasons or motivation to choose one over the other, then some people think we're, we're most free. So if the choice is between having a coffee uh, or, or drinking motor oil uh, or, you know, not picking either, some people would say, well, you know, you like coffee, so you're obviously inclined to drink the coffee. You don't like drinking motor oil. Uh, I've actually tasted it once before, <laughs> well, probably more than once when I worked on cars, and uh, not, not something that I'd want. I also know that it would be bad for me, right? So there's, there's a sort of dislike on a, on a bodily, visceral level, uh, and then there's also knowledge that that's not good for me. I'll take the coffee. Right? And so somebody might come along and say, oh, you're not really free because you're already inclined towards taking the coffee. That would be freedom of indifference. Descartes says that that is the lowest degree of freedom whatsoever. It's not really freedom in a meaningful sense. Instead, what we would want is a different kind of freedom. Now, what's wrong with this lower level of freedom? He says that it's actually a defect, default in French, of knowledge. That's what it stems from. Uh, and not a perfection of the will. The idea here is if we really understood these, these options in front of us, we wouldn't actually be indifferent to them in any real case. So what's a, a more robust conception of freedom? Um, you know, Descartes is going to say that choices are actually made more freely when uh, divine grace or natural knowledge inclines the will to one side or the other. This is the way in which the will exercises its perfection concretely. So he says, I know clearly that the true or good are to be found there in that thing, um, that, that they're going to be encountered in that. Uh, that could be one thing that would incline my will there. So in the case of the coffee, it's not really the true, it's more the good. I know that I like the coffee, I know that I can use the caffeine. I also know by contrast that the bad is going to be found, bad at least in terms of consuming it, in terms of the motor oil. <clears throat> so I choose, because I'm already inclined to, the coffee. I'm not less free by having that motivational structure. I'm actually more free because I can follow what's good for me and enjoy the good, right? Similarly, when we make judgments about things, we're deciding between two sets of options, you know, uh, did this happen because of that or did this happen because of that? I'm going to make a judgment. The more knowledge I have, the more I'm actually free to choose the true as opposed to the false. Um, it could also be that Descartes says, God disposes my inner thoughts that way. And when he says, God disposes my inner thoughts that way, what we have to understand is not that God is, you know, monkeying around inside of our heads and putting in fake, you know, memories or, you know, wrong-headed uh, uh, plans of action or, or false propositions. Rather, God is inclining us in the way that we would want to, to go already. So, you know, God gives me a sense to avoid this particular situation. You might think about Socrates daimon. That could actually fit under this sort of case. And Descartes says we're not rendered unfree because of that. We're actually made more free. So the freedom of the will to do all these important things, affirm, deny, pursue, or avoid, and to bear upon itself in saying, hey, I'm only going to go so far, uh, not any further. That is to place limits upon itself, to direct itself. That is actually enhanced by knowledge, natural knowledge, he says, or by divine grace. So this is very different than the, the conception of freedom as the liberty of indifference. Instead, it's a more substantive, a robust conception of freedom of the will.
The last thing that, that I'll say is that Descartes also considers the question, do I have any grounds for complaint about my will? Maybe God could have given me a will that wouldn't you know, be so unruly, that wouldn't go beyond whatever limits are established by the understanding. And Descartes says, well, you know, you really don't have anything to complain about talking to himself in the meditations because you've discovered how you can avoid error it takes you some work, but that's you using the will on itself. The other thing that he points out is he says, this understanding of the will as, as being so great that you can't imagine any or conceive of anything greater of that sort, any greater will, it's also the case that the will is a unity. And you can't take away stuff from the will without rendering it not a will, not a human will. So if you were to take away some of the freedom, if God had put like, you know, a natural set of governors in us so that we wouldn't go wrong, it really wouldn't be free will at that point. So we've got here a little bit of a theodicy as well in the meditations, as much as Descartes is going to provide. He's not a huge theodicy provider. So that is Descartes' conception of what the will is and how the will is free.